Okay, uh, I would like to thank Anya for inviting me here. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Is it kind of my voice loud enough? So it, it's really a great pleasure to come here uh, and to teach for classes in this university. This is not the first time I'm in Russia. I think it's the fourth time uh, 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 I'm in Russia. As a matter of fact, I'm old enough that I actually I think the first two times I was actually in Soviet Union, although it was it, it was in Moscow. Uh, so, so now it's my third, fourth time, but the first time uh, in St. Petersburg, this beautiful city. So I'm really very happy to be here. Uh, and then, as, as Anya said, you know, we, we, we can have. Uh, I, I, I suggest that we have kind of three kinds of questions. If you listen to my talk and there is something that you don't understand, then, then please just wave your hand and then I'll answer your question. Because there's no point sitting because then you, you cannot follow anything, and then and then you know this is a waste of your time. After, if you have kind of a questions that are kind of like overall questions but you don't need to know now, then please wait till the end of my, my, my lecture and then we can discuss it. And if you are a shy person or if you don't want to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to ask in, in public, uh, then I, I, I can stay here as, as long as you want. I have no plans for, for tonight. So I'm very happy like, to, to, to sit here and then we can, we can uh, meet one on one and talk either about my talk or I can answer any question uh, that, uh, that, that you want related to my talk or related to science or anything that, that I may try to, to answer. And lastly, I, I, I want to say that in my opinion, in current learning, you know, it's not so important. So I am actually a, a director of a course at Harvard Medical Students called Cancer Cell Biology. I teach this course uh, every, this, luckily for me, it's only every two years, and actually it's running right now. So I, I'm supposed to be in Boston, but it's okay, I can, I can leave for a few days uh, and, and be here. And what I, what I teach Harvard students, and I tell them that I think that, that actual knowledge, the facts, are not so important. Because I, I you know, you, you are learning right now, and then five years from now, most of the facts uh, that, that I tell you either turn out to be wrong, or they were right like five years ago, but now it's going to be completely different. So I think that just plain facts are not so important. I think it's more important that you kind of, as, as a young scientist, familiarize yourself what are the major questions in the field and how we are approaching them and w what are the methods that, that they are using to approach them. So for your own work, you can see you, you, can, you can see what are the things that seem to be very solid and what are the seems, things that not to be very solid and also kind of from historical point of view to get a feeling how certain facts that I'll tell you that were taken for granted like, like kind of a facts like in a Bible turn out to be wrong. And this is I think useful for you for for your own research. On the other hand, the little details of what I tell you, if you if, if, if you if you if you if you if you get them, that's great. But you really don't need to kind of to engage your cerebral cortex to, to, to remember every single detail uh, that, that, that I'm telling you. So with this kind of uh, um, uh, introduction, or kind of the, the, the general introduction, well, let me tell you. I, I'm sure you have seen uh, this kind of slide, or or derivative thereof, and it basically shows the so-called signal transduction pathways. And these are the, uh, the, 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 the chain of events of a change of the pro chain of proteins that, that, that cells utilize to sense the extracellular environment and to transduce the signal uh, to the cell nucleus. Many of those signals are growth promoting. They, sell, they tell the cell where the cell should divide or should not divide. Uh, and by the way, I, I should apologize if I, if I make things too simple and explain uh, uh, things that, that you know very well. I apologize. I don't want to, 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 to insult your intelligence. But I think it's better to kind of to, to say things, even they are obvious, rather than to, to, uh, to, to leave um, somebody wondering. So, so all those external signals eventually converge on a cell cycle machinery which operates in the cell nucleus. The cell cycle machinery, the core cell cycle machinery, this is the heart the ancient clock uh, that tells the cells where the cells should divide. And my four lectures are going to be about this core cell cycle machinery which operates in the cell nucleus. And the proteins that drive cell division, these are the proteins that have been conserved from yeast to our cells. And the, the, the proteins that drive this cell cycle progression are called cyclins, and they are shown as blue ovals, uh, and they are named uh, in an alphabetical order, starting from A and finishing at E. Uh, and those, pro the, those cycling proteins, one of the major functions, or not the, not the only one, is that they would bind and activate the catalytic partners. The cyclins itself do not have an enzymatic activity, but they activate the protein kinases uh, and enzymes that would phosphate groups called 
cyclic independent kinases or CTKs. And then together those cyclic independent CTKs phosphorylate cellular proteins thereby driving a cell cycle progression. Now maybe we can we, we, we can actually take one step back and ask our, and, and, and remind you what is the cell cycle? Why, why is it called a cycle? So this is called a cycle because it goes back and forth. So when cells divide uh, th throughout the, the division, the cells go through this cycle of events. And then every cell biologist that, that ever looked at the cell has probably seen a cell that is dividing because you can see condensing chromosomes and then chromosome being separated into, into two daughter cells. And this phase of the cell cycle is called mitosis and this is the most obvious phase of the cell cycle. The second phase that is not so obvious by looking at the cells but intuitively obvious is that in order for cells to divide they have to duplicate their genetic material. So they, they, they all, the, the all chromosomal genetic material must be copied, must be duplicated and this takes place in the S phase which is the S for synthesis. So, so pretty Pretty much every cell biologist would intuitively know that when a cell needs to divide, it has to duplicate its genetic material and its S phase or DNA synthesis phase, and then eventually it has to divide them into two daughter cells, and this is the M phase. Uh, what's not so well appreciated is that, but 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 but, but you can realize when, when you when you follow the cells, is that as the cells divide uh, and exit mitosis, it's not only it doesn't immediately synthesize DNA, it waits. Uh, and therefore this, this first waiting period was called gap phase. Gap because gap means nothing, the, the cells are just sitting and waiting. And then, and then also you can actually visualize uh, the DNA synthesis by giving cells, for example, some, some radioactive label that is going to be incorporated to DNA. So you can see when the cells are undergoing the S phase and then you, you will see that once the S phase is completed, the cells are not going to divide immediately they are going to wait again. And then the second waiting period is called a GAP2 or, or G2 phase of the, of the cell cycle. Now we now know that those GAP phases are actually wrong names because it's not GAP, uh, although we still use this name G1 and G2, but this is not kind of an inert phase that cells are sitting and waiting, but this is actually the most important phase of the cell cycle. It's the most important cell of the cell cycle because during this time a cell which sample mitogenic, mitogenic environment and it will decide whether in the presence of growth factors it will activate an autonomous cell division program that one set in motion is going to take the cell through the remainder of the cell cycle or alternatively in the absence of mitogenic stimulation or when external stimulation tells cells not to divide a cell will withdraw from the active cell cycle into the quiescent G0 state. Now this is a fundamental decision in the life of the cell. Do I need to divide or do I go to quiescent? Uh, and of course the overwhelming majority of, 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 of cells in our body are in a quiescent state. They only go back to the cell cycle when needed. And then the mitogenic signals, uh, the, the oncogenic signals, are the ones that tell cells to divide whenever the cell should not be dividing. All those signals eventually impinge on the, on the cell cycle machinery, the G1 cell cycle machinery. So from the cancer point of view, most of us are focusing on the proteins that operate in the G1 phase of the cell cycle because of this important commitment for the cell division and because of the fact that, this, that, the, that, the, that the proteins that operate in this phase of the cell cycle, namely D-type cyclines together with the kinase part in CDK4 or CDK6 and E-type cyclines together with CDK2 are deranged in many human cancer types. Because of course you, you, you can get cancer by the way uh, that, uh, that, that you have uh, oncogenic stimulation of, of the cell cycle machinery. Alternatively you can have lesions in the cell cycle machinery. You can have activation in cell cycle machinery and this machinery is going to drive cell division even though the extracellular environment tells the cells not to divide. So the, at the biochemical level, uh, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the mitogenic signals induce D-type cyclines, they bind cyclin-dependent kinase 4 and 6 and phosphorylate the retinoblastoma protein. The retinoblastoma protein in early G1 phase exists in active hypo or unphosphorylated state. And in this state, it binds and inactivates transcription factors, such as E2F transcription factors. Once the mitogenic signals induce D-type cyclines, they would bind CDK4 and CDK6 and put phosphate groups on the retinoblastoma protein. This phosphorylation 
parasol inactivates the stomach protein and releases the E2F transcription factors, which were previously bound and kept by the stomach protein in an active state. Once the E2F transcription factors are liberated, they induce E2F targets, including cytin E. So this is the way how, how the activity of D-type cyclins, phosphorins, retinoblastoma protein, and, and through the E2F, induces the second cycline class called cytin E. Once induced, cytin E is going to bind CDK2, activate this kinase, and further phosphorylate the retinoblastoma protein. So this is the positive feedback loop. This is this commitment, irreversible commitment, to the cell division that I just mentioned. Once again, the growth factors would induce D-type cyclines, phosphorylation of retinoblastoma protein, release of some E2F transcription factors, E2F's induced transcription like cytin E, cytin E further phosphorylates retinoblastoma protein, more E2F becomes released, more cytin E becomes, uh, be becomes active, and this, mean, this, this leads to a complete total inactivation of the retinoblastoma protein, and now cytin E together with CDK2 can phosphorylate additional proteins that are already beyond the retinoblastoma protein, and these are proteins also um, playing role in cell cycle progression, in the initiation of DNA replication of the entry into the S phase, on histone biosynthesis, and also on the duplication of centrosomes. Now, D-type cyclines, uh, in addition to this kinase-dependent function, which I just uh, indicated to you, namely phosphorating the retinoblastoma protein, and I, I, I did, did, did indicate that this is the mechanism how D-type cyclines induce the second cycline transcriptionally, the D-type cyclines also activate E-type cyclines in a second mechanism through inhibitor titration. Namely, there are molecules called cell cycle inhibitors. These are small proteins, for example, the wild called P27, it's called P27 because of the size. And P27 binds cytin E CDK2 and inhibits this kinase activity. But the very same molecule is using by cytin D together with CDK4 as an assembly factor. So when the mitogens induce the level of D-type cyclines, in order to, to form an active complex, it needs this glue P27 protein. But P27 protein is the inhibitor of other cyclin-dependent kinases. So by inducing D-type cyclines, a cell steals the inhibitor from cytin E CDK2 to cytin D CDK4, and through inhibitor titration activates cytin E CDK2. So the bottom line is that by inducing D type cyclines, a cell activates this autonomous cell division program, it activates cytin E through several independent mechanisms, through the transcriptional mechanisms with the E2Fs, or also through this uh, inhibitor uh, sequestration. So once again, the mitogens would induce cytin D, and this activation of cytin D induces cytin E, and this triggers irreversible the entry of cells uh, into, the, the, into the cell cycle. Now the side that I showed you was simplified because there is a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I was talking about cyclin D and cyclin E, but in reality there are three D-type cyclins, actually these, these three should go here, so there's cyclin D1, D2, D3, there are three different proteins encoded by three different genes in three different chromosomes, but they are very similar proteins and they perform very similar functions, they bind and activate the same catalytic partner called CDK4, CDK6, and there are two E-type cyclins called cyclin E1 and E2. Once again, two different proteins, two different chromosomes, but very similar, and bind the same catalytic partner, primarily CDK2. And as I mentioned to you, both D-type cyclines and E-type cyclines together with S kinases are very important for cancer field because all mitogenic and oncogenic signals converge on those proteins. And I also mentioned that in cancer cells, one of the mechanisms is just hyperactivate this protein. And once you hyperactivate, the cell doesn't care about the extracellular environment, but now the cell cycle engine is, 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 is telling the cells to divide. So this slide I borrowed from a paper published in Nature by my colleague from our institute, Matthew Meyerson, where they, they took 3,000 human cancers and they systematically looked at the most commonly amplified genes in human cancer genome. And they found that cytin D1 is the second most frequently amplified gene in all human cancer types. And its kinase factor, the CDK4, is number four. Now this is 
only the top list. And if you, if, of course, if you look a little bit uh, lower, you will find that all proteins that I just showed you so far are amplified and overexpressed uh, in human cancers. This is, this is the, the, the section uh, through, uh, through, through a breast cancer. This is staining for cytokine D1. Uh, and this, uh, this, this black staining is overexpression of cytokine D1 in human breast cancer. Uh, this, uh, this, um, uh, paper, the, the, this protein is very actively studied. It just like as I was putting this this, uh, this 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 presentation together, I did a quick PubMed search in, in this room actually a minute ago for Sakin D1, and there are 13,744 papers just on Sakin D1 published so far, and 400 and 470 uh, in, 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 in seven this year. You you can quickly calculate uh, you know uh, in order to to read the paper and to really understand it. I need the least at least an hour. So probably if I wanted to, to read all papers on Sakin D1 uh, uh, that then was published this year, I wouldn't be able to do anything else. I wouldn't be able to come here because I'll be reading those papers. And then actually this is one of eight proteins uh, that, 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 that we work. So there's actually more published on those proteins that, that one can possibly read. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit today about Sakin D1 and breast cancer. Uh, so I mentioned to you that Sakin D1 is, is the second most frequently amplified gene in all human cancers. But what's most striking is the involvement of Sakin D1 in breast cancer. So breast cancer is an enormous health problem. As they say in the Western world, but of course, you know, in the Eastern world is exactly the same. One out of eight women uh, is going to develop breast cancer in their lifetime. So this is really kind of very, very high proportion. And 50% of those women are going to develop breast cancer because of overexpression of Sakin D1. So I think it's fair to say that one out of 16 women are going to have very serious uh, health problems because of the abnormal um, uh, activity uh, uh, of cycling. But not, not cell cycle machinery, just this, just this, uh, this, uh, this one protein. So this immediately, this immediately told people back 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that if cycling D1 is abnormally expressed in the cancers of these poor women, and actually. It's not that, that this is coincidence because there was a very, very nice experiment from a Schmidt lab where people made the transgenic mice where they, when they engineered mice to overexpress. So when you make transgenic mice, we insert a gene into the mouse genome and then put it under the specific promoter. So we, so we overexpress a gene in a particular compartment. So this group uh, uses the MMTV. MMTV is a promoter that is breast specific. So if you want to express something in a mammary epithelium of mice, you put it under the, uh, the MMTV promoter and then they overexpress cycling D1 so they mimic the human disease and they make mice that overexpress in a breast cycling D1 and they, they, these mice get breast cancer. So, so this is a cancer causing gene when, when, when it's, when it's overexpressed. So, 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 so it's no brainer that, that cycling D1 might be a very good uh, therapeutic target for breast cancer because this is a cancer causing protein which is overexpressed in over 50% of human breast cancers. However, there was a dogma in the field uh, that, that this is a not a good target. And the reason being that when those proteins were discovered, it was, it was a dogma that each of those proteins is needed for cell proliferation. That if, if you, the, 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 this, is, this is such an essential clock, cell cycle clock, that if you inactivate this protein, well, maybe you would stop proliferation of, of tumor cells, but of course, you would stop proliferation of every cell in the body. So, we actually challenge this dogma by making mice without sucking D1. And this is, this is the gene knockout technology where we make a mouse from a single cell, we make a mouse from a stem cell, from embryonic stem cell, and through the process called homologous recombination that maybe you heard about, maybe you didn't, if you want to know the details I can tell you later, but the bottom line, we can go to a single cell and we can remove one gene. So, so if the mouse has, let's say, 30,000 of genes, we can make the mouse that has 29,999. We just removed one gene, and this is the gene without cycling D1. So now we have a normal mouse, which has all the genes, and the cycling D1 knockout mouse, where we just remove one gene. And by comparing them, we can say what happens if you remove one gene, meaning if you remove one protein. And it turns out that if you remove one um, protein cycling D1, that these mice are viable, 
they live normal lives. They, they have only two abnormalities. One is the retina. So this is the retina of a wild type mouse. And this is a hypoplastic retina from sucking the knockout mice. And the second is the mammary glands of wild type mice. Where they do, when, when the female becomes pregnant, they undergo this kind of full it's called lobular viral development, and this development is absent or retarded in psychic D1 knockout mice. So it's very, it's very minor phenotype. The, 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 this is not required for, for viability, and the, the, the summary is psychic D1 deficient mice develop relatively normally. And therefore, we thought that psychic D1 might be actually a good target in breast cancer. So a student in my lab, Chuen Yu, originally from China, asked if the oncogenic signals, truly signals with psychin D1 for abnormal cell proliferation, what happens in mice, they don't have psychin D1, would those oncogenic signals be able to signal to uh, abnormal cell proliferation, would they be able to drive tumor formation? And the, the, the question, the, the experimental question that she asked, is she asked, does the absence of psychin D1 protect psychin D1 knockout mice from breast cancers? Or stated differently, are psychin D1 knockout mice resistant to breast cancers? And the address she addressed this is she took psychin D1 knockout mice and she crossed them with four breast cancer pro strains. So luckily for us, other people make mice that develop breast cancers, and they use this transgenic technology that I just um, um, mentioned to you. In, in a transgenic technology, you don't knock out the gene, you don't remove it, but you actually insert the gene into the mouse genome, but put into a specific promoter. So I, I mentioned to you that MMTV, mouse mammary tumor virus, this is a breast-specific promoter, and this is going to target your gene of interest to mammary epithelium. And, and uh, for different groups made mice that overexpress either RAS oncogene or B2 or MIGR wind in mammary glands through this, through this um, um, uh, breast-specific promoter, and they develop breast cancers. But by crossing these, uh, transgenic mice with psychin D1 knockout mice would generate the two groups. The psychin D1 wild type, the control group containing this transgene, when these are the ones that we know are going to develop tumors. And psychin D1 knockout, this is our experimental group. And now we can compare the, we, this Australian, compare the incidence between this group versus that group. And she's presenting uh, the, the data as a percentage of tumor-free mice. So at the beginning of experiment, 100% are tumor-free, and then as they die, this is time, eventually they all develop tumors, meaning percentage tumor free is zero because they all develop tumors. And then in black, you see psychin D1 wild type mice, and in red, psychin D1 knockout mice. So as you can see, there is no big difference between psychin D1 wild type and knockout mice, indicating that the, that the tumors don't care whether psychin D1 is present or not. This, this cancer causing gene WINT1 can form tumors in the presence or in the absence of psychin D1. The second cancer causing gene oncogene is MIC, and once again, this is the tumor incidence in a psychin D1 wild type background, this is psychin D1 knockout background, and once again, there is no difference. However, when we took another gene called RB2 or new, well, here the result was very dramatic. This is the incidence of, of, of control mice, and if you don't have psychin D1, these mice are completely resistant. They never develop any breast cancers. Now, this oncogene, RB2, signals through the RAS. And more through luck rather than through some intelligent design, we actually included into our, our, our group, as, as, as you may remember from a few slides back, not only the, the mice expressing this oncogene, but also expressing that oncogene. And it was very gratifying to see there was the control mice developed to most, the psychic D1 knockout mice were completely protected against cancers. So this is the summary of this, uh, of, uh, 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 of this experiment. The second D1 knockout mice are susceptible, they develop MIC and wind-driven tumors, but they are completely resistant, they never develop tumors if the tumor is driven by RAS or by RB2 oncogene. Now, you could say, well, maybe this is just resistant to all tumors. No. So, so the, although this, this MMTV um, promoter specifically targets the, the cancer the, the, the cancer causing oncogene to mammary gland, but it's a bit a bit leaky, and there is some expression in salivary glands, and therefore this uh, RAS, uh, MMTV RAS mice they develop 
very small um, numbers, also tumors in the salivary glands. One out of 21 mice develop salivary gland tumors. In second D1 knockout background, on the other hand, they never developed any breast tumors, but three mice develop salivary gland tumors. This doesn't mean, of course, that, that second D1 predisposes them to salivary gland tumors. It's just these mice, oh, I'm sorry, these mice are dying because of breast cancer and they never have any chance to develop salivary gland tumors. I'm just showing you this to indicate that although cycling D1 knockout mice never developed any breast cancers, but the same oncogene can cause in these mice um, salivary tumors, indicating that this is a specific requirement for cycling D1 just in breast cancer formation, not in any kind of cancer in any tissue. And the second argument that was made when we presented this data is people would say, well, there are three D-type cyclines, D1, D2, D3, you knock out cyclin D1 and you show that they are, that, because the first argument people say, well, maybe they are resistant to all cancers. Well, no, because they also develop salivary tumors. So then people say, well, there are three D-type cyclines, D1, D2, D3, you knocked out D1 and then you show that they never develop breast cancers, maybe this is non-specific effect, many any D-type cycling knockout would be, would, be, would be resistant to breast cancers. So here we also generated independently mice lacking cycling D2 or mice lacking cycling D3. We crossed them with this MMTV RAS strain, I already reported to you, is that cycling D1 knockout mice never develop tumors, uh, um, breast cancers, but the D2 knockout mice or D3 knockout mice they do develop tumors. We had 25 tumors in D3 knockout background, 20 tumors in D2 knockout background, in zero in D1. So this is specific for second D1, and this is specific for, for breast cancer. So the, the, the bottom line, the summary of, 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 of this, I think, very important experiment by Chuen Yu is that second D1 function is required for breast cancer initiation, right? Because if, if we knock out second D1, then these mice never develop any breast cancers. Well. Cycle D1 function, that's great, but it doesn't tell you which exactly cycle D1 function is required for initiation. Now, I, I did mention to you is that cycle D1 binds and activates cycle independent kinase 4. It can also activate cycle independent kinase 6. And it can perform 15 different functions, which I didn't put on this slide because I didn't want to, to overwhelm you and to make um, it too complicated. That being said, the activation of those two kinases, the CDK4 and CDK6, is the best described function of cycling D1. And in mammary glands, the major partner is CDK4, not CDK6. CDK6 is mostly in lymphoid organs, but in breast, it's CDK4. And therefore, Chuenyi and made the hypothesis is that function of cycling D1 here means function of cycling D1 to activate CDK4. So to address this question, Chuenian asks, okay, so I have shown that if I knock out cycling D1, these mice are resistant to breast cancer. What about CDK4 knockout mice? What if, I, what if we knock out the catalytic factor of cycling D1? Would they be also resistant to breast cancer? Well, luckily for us, we did not have to make these mice because these mice were made by Hiraki Kiyokawa. So we got from Hi Hi Hiraki CDK4 knockout mice and we did exactly the same experiment and I showed you uh, a, a, a minute ago, we crossed it with a breast cancer prone RB2 or new strain and generated two groups, either MMTV oncogene CDK4 wild type, we know they are going to develop tumors, this is the control group, or CDK4 knockout, and this is our control uh, experimental group. So again, this is percentage of tumor-free mice, the control mice developing tumors as, as I promise you they would do, but CDK4 knockout mice are completely resistant to breast cancers. I'll show you here the numbers. In control mice, uh, uh, 42 out of 42 mice develop tumors, and the total number of tumors is 139. In knockout, 0 out of 38 mice got tumors, and of course the number of tumors is 0. We didn't do a statistical test on this, but I suspect that this is significant, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this difference. So, so, I've shown you that if we knock out cytin D1, or if we knock out CDK4, then we make mice resistant to breast cancer. Can we then conclude that cytin D1 CDK4 kinase is required for breast cancer initiation? What, what do you think? This is enough 
to show we thought you know about initiation right the uh, psychin d1 is a ca catalytic partner cdk4 we knock out psychin d1 resistant we knock out cdk4 they're resistant can we now conclude that psychin d1 cdk4 kinase is required for initiation sure. sorry kind of. Say, say kind of kind of but, but so, so you think, of course, the, the, everything is kind of, nothing is black and white. But, but so, so I understand that this is yes, that, that, that this is yes. Anybody feels differently that, 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 that we haven't shown it yet? Right, so overexpression is a great experiment. And it actually was done. People did overexpress psychin D1, and they have shown that this causes uh, that, that it causes breast cancer. But this just shows you that psychin D1 plays role, right? If we knock out psychin D1, we show that psychin D1 is required. We knock out CDK4, we show that CDK4 is required. I just want to know whether there is anybody who is not happy yet, and and that, that if we knock out psychin D1 and its catalytic partner CDK4, we prevent cancer, and therefore I want to conclude that psychin D1 CDK4 kinase is required for cancer initiation. And I want to find out is there anybody who, who is still not satisfied? So everybody's satisfied? But I told you, but, but so, so I'm disappointed because I did tell you in the introduction is that psychin D1 CDK4 has a two different functions. One is that psychin D1 together with CDK4 is, is a kinase, right? It phosphorylates proteins. But I also told you that psychin D1 together with CDK4 has this very important function of titrating P27 and activating psychin ECDK2. So if we knock out psychin D1, let's go back, if we knock out psychin D1 or if we knock out CDK4, yes, we kill the kinase activity of, of this complex, but we also, oops, sorry, kill the activity, uh, ability to titrate P27. So we know that psychin D1 CDK4 complex is required, but we still don't know whether this is a kinase function or this is titration function. We don't know yet, and maybe some. Of, but why do you think it's important? Is it, is it really is it really worth to spend another three years of two people to find out whether this is a kinase dependent or titration dependent, or this is just kind of pure theoretical question? Do you see any reason for, for investigating it further? Or do you think, if you are a graduate student, you will say, you are probably graduate students, you will say this is enough? To know what can be used as a target for drugs? Exactly. If this is a kinase dependent function, then we can in, invest some time or some money into developing inhibitors. If this is a kinase independent function by the titrating, then well, of course, we can try, but we would have to, 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 to block the interaction of those two proteins, which is different. And how, how, how do you think we could, we could distinguish between, it's a difficult question, but maybe, maybe somebody knows, how we can distinguish wh whether this is a kinase-dependent function or kinase-independent function? So how would you do? Uh, the problem is that not many targets are known, and also, of course, if you knock out psychin D1 or CDK4, the phosphorylational targets will go down. But it still doesn't tell you whether this is the key molecular event. Okay, so I'll have. Yeah, if they, so that's a great, of course, if, if we had the, the inhibitor of, of the kinase, that would be a great experiment to do. But nobody wants to make the inhibitor until we show that actually it's the kinase that is, that, that is required. So, so, so now we have the inhibitors, and actually I'll, I'll show you uh, um, uh, the, the, but at that time we did not have inhibitors, but that would be a great way to do it. Can you make a mutation to, to suppress the kinase activity? 
That's exactly what we did. Very good. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's uh, that, that's that's what we did. So there is a mutation of cytokine D1 called K112E, and this point mutant made many years ago and uh, was not that interesting for many years. And this is the mutant that can bind CDK4, but that cannot activate the kinase activity. But on the other hand, this mutant is completely fully able to titrate the the, the, the P27. So now, what we decided to do, we decided to make a knock-in strain of mice. So I, I, I told you, uh, I'm sure you know this, again I apologize if I tell you the obvious things, but, but I reminded myself that the way we made the knockout mice is that we make them out from a single stem cell and we just remove one gene. In the knock-in mouse what we do is we don't remove the gene, but we just put a mutation into the gene. So, well, in reality, we take out the gene and then we put it back when it belongs, but with a single point mutation. So, what we did is that we made a knock and strain of mice where into this second exon we put this a single point mutation which makes Sakin D1 unable to activate CDK4. So, we changed one. Okay, well, I think we, I should say. So this work was done by Mark Landis, uh, who was, uh, he, so Mark Landis is an interesting story. He, uh, I think actually this, his family comes from Russia, but many, m many generations back. And he was a graduate student in Phil Heinz's lab, but he came to my lab to do this knock-in. And he, I, I think he did a very, a very nice job, and you can, you, you, can, you, can, you, you can see in a minute. But then after doing PhD in my lab, he decided that he's not that interested in science. And he became an editor, and he was the editor of Molecular cell. So I hope I treated him well uh, in my lab, although now he left molecular cell and now he's editor of the cancer discovery. So, 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 so what Mark did is that he, he through the gene targeting, through the going to a single cell, he made a point mutation in the mouse genome where he, where, where he made cytokine D1, the, the experiment that, that, that you wanted to do, that, that cytokine D1, that his kinase is dead. And now, when he brought these mice to homozygosity, he could ask, so, so, here's, so here's the mice, or we have the mice, that express cytokine D1, which express CDK4, that cytokine D1 is binding CDK4, but cannot activate the kinase activity. So we have the complex, the complex is titrating P27, but its kinase is dead. And then I mentioned to you, is that if we knock out, this is wild type retina, I mentioned to you that if we knock out um, uh, um, uh, cytokine D1, uh, the, the, the retina is hypoplastic. These pictures are not most pretty, because already at this time Mark knew that he's not going to be a scientist and didn't put too much attention to making beautiful pictures. Uh, but I'm sure he's a great editor. But, but, but nevertheless, although the, the, these pictures are sloppy, but, but, but I hope you can, you can appreciate that the, if, you, if you knock out cytokine D1, the retina is hypoplastic as I told you, and if you have this kinase dead mouse which express kinase dead cytokine D1, the retina is normal, indicating that you need cytokine D1 for retinal development, but the kinase activity is not important. It's probably the titration of P27 that is so important. Likely, li 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 likewise, this is mammary gland from a wild type mouse, and this is from cytokine D1 knockout mouse. I told you the cytokine D1 knockout mouse doesn't develop normally, but the kinase dead mouse develops normal mammary gland, once again, indicating that the kinase kinase activity is dispensable for, for, for development. But is it dispensable for cancer? Well, we took uh, Marx mice, kinase dead mice, we crossed with breast cancer prone mice, and as you can see, when the control mice died, these mice were completely, uh, uh, were, were completely resistant. Now, Again, as you can see, Mark like stopped the experiment just right when the last control mouse died, and I tried to, to explain to him that maybe it would look better if we if we could observe them for longer, but he didn't want to do it. But anyway, I, I think that the message is there. The, 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 the kinase dead mice are completely resistant to breast cancer. I find it very remarkable because in these mice, we just change one base pair. So they, they are uh, roughly speaking three times 10 to the ninth base pairs in the mouse genome. And by changing one single base pair in the mouse genome, we can make mice completely resistant to breast cancer. I, I found it amazing. Such a simple, such a simple change and such a kind of uh, uh, profound, um, uh, profound effect. At the, at the molecular level, this, 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 this single base pair change means that we are making the complex the key Cycling like D1 CDK4 complex that is present there, but the kinase activity is completely dead. And therefore, now I think we could um, uh, uh, conclude is that cycling D1 kinase activity is required for, 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 for tumorogenesis. And we uh, 
encourage pharmaceutical companies to come up with the with inhibitors of this kinase. However, we were faced by very serious criticism. First of all, people told us the system that we are using is artificial. We are making such like new knockout mice, as I mentioned to you, from a single cell. So from the first cell, the cell does not have cycling D1 and therefore can have some compensatory mechanism. It can upregulate one protein, then regulate another, so, so it can compensate. But people argued this is, th this is just a very mild phenotype because this is a developmental compensation. But, but if you turn off cycling, if, if you made a mouse with cycling D1 and then you would turn off cycling, oh, you would kill the mouse because now, you know, th this is, th there is no time for, for compensation. And of course, that's going to happen in humans because uh, uh, people will ask me politely, are you proposing to make a uh, and knock out humans? Of course not. Hmm, okay. So, I, okay. So, so, of course, this is not doable because we are, even if we had to, we cannot turn off uh, um, uh, uh, the, the activity. The second thing that people told me is they said, this is really great. You have shown beautifully, and I, I, I must say that there's a group of Magano Barbacid, our friendly competitors, collaborators from Spain, that, that is doing very similar work with, the, with identical um, conclusions, which is we are focusing on cyclins. They are focusing on psychic dependent kinases. So people said, well, your groups have shown very nicely and that you can prevent uh, the, the cancer. But of course, in a clinic, we want to cure cancer, not to prevent. And, and showing that something is required for cancer formation has nothing to do with showing that this is needed for cancer maintenance. And thirdly, people say, even if all what you have shown us is right, if you had a magic drug that could inhibit the kinase activity of cytokin D1, this would block the cancer cell proliferation. But this is not a, a, a good a cancer target because this is a proliferation. So it means that you would have to give this drug you know, for, for the entire life of a patient. Because the minute you withdraw this, the, this drug, then the cells will go back to, to the cell cycle. This is not a target that we want. We want to, to kill cancer cells, we want to eradicate cancer cells, but not just to, 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 to hold them. So, so these are kind of clouds over the horizon and very serious criticism about the work. I, I talked about the reasonably old genetic experiments and mentioned to you that then all this work uh, kind of raised two important issues. One is that we, we have shown that we can prevent tumor initiation, uh, but we have never shown that actually this is required for tumor maintenance, and people argued that these are completely two different uh, functions. The second is that we, we, we have shown that if you, if, if you genetically um, delete cytokine D1 or CDK4, then there's no major consequences. But people argue that this is a developmental compensation. And if you, if you acutely shut down cytokine D1 in a mouse that developed with cytokine D1, then this would have a devastating consequences. And lastly, people argued that even if that even if we're so lucky that there was no consequence of acute shutdown uh, on, uh, on, on mouse physiology. And at the same time, if we had some consequence of tumor biology, this would just be a transient cell cycle arrest. And then the, fact, the inhibitor is maybe not worthy uh, to, to develop because this inhibitor would have been administered to the patients through the, through the whole life. So Yu, Yun Choi uh, is a former postdoc in the lab. She just left. Uh, Yun is actually originally from Korea, although she was uh, she, she came to the United States when, when she was a little girl uh, and she actually decided to, to, to devote five years of her time, at, uh, of her life, in fact it was six years, to, to, to test whether, whether indeed she can turn off cycling D1 in an adult mouse and what would happen and if she can do this in a can cancer causing mouse. Uh, and this, this, this was very, I, I think, satisfying and gave us some very unexpected findings. So first of all, uh, uh, I need to introduce you or remind you uh, how we can uh, knock out the gene, not through, through day one, not through, through, through the first cell, but in a way that we can turn it off suddenly and acutely. And this is done using a conditional knockout. 
And conditional knockout is done is that when we go to this single cell, stem cell, rather than knocking out uh, our gene, we just put two short sequencing called locks P size, about 30 base pairs, and we surround the key exons of the gene. So a mouse that is made in this way expresses our protein, in, in, in our case, Sakin D1, because all coding exons are present. And the only difference between wild type mouse and, and this mouse, which of course you wouldn't tell with the naked eye, is that this mouse in a gene contains those short locks P um, sites. So this does not um, 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 uh, change the activity of the protein unless we cross this mice with another strain which expresses clear recombinase. And then whenever the clear recombinase see this LOXP sites, it would delete everything that is between those two LOXP sites and therefore delete our gene and making uh, and making a knockout. And the, the, the trick we are using is that we are using we meaning Yun Choi, she's using ESR1 CRE strain. This is the strain that expresses ubiquitously, meaning in every cell it expresses CRE recombinase, but the CRE is inactive. The CRE is inactive because in cytoplasmic, and in order to activate, you need to, 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 to give mice tamoxifen. So this is a very nice system because we have mice that express like in D1 from this as we call it, flux locus, that express Cree in all cells, but the Cree is inactive. And one day we can come to the lab, we can give mice tamoxifen, and we can activate Cree in all cells. We can delete cycling D1 essentially in all cells, and we can see what happens. So this way she could do experiment number one, meaning develop mice, which developed um, from, from single cell to being a three-month-old sexually mature uh, or middle-aged mice. And then she can turn off Psychin D1 in, in all body of this idle mage mouse. And she found that there are absolutely no abnormalities. And she observed mice for one month. She, uh, she, um, she, she took the blood every few months and she did 55 different biochemical tests. Actually, I did have a slide showing those 55 biochemical tests, but somebody said, you know, this is ridiculous because there's no difference. So why don't you just tell them that there's no difference? So, so I, I, I mentioned that the Psychin D1 is required for development because, for example, the eye, um, the, the eye cannot develop normally. There's small retina, but now once we go past the development, uh, once we turn off Psychin D1 in a young adult or a middle-aged adult, there's absolutely no consequence for mouse physiology. And the whole, it indicates the, the first kind of critique or the, uh, the, the concern that, uh, that, the, 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 that the phenotype of Sakin D1 knockout mice or very little phenotype of Sakin D1 knockout mice is some kind of developmental plasticity is not true. This is not developmental plasticity. We can turn it off. Or if there is plasticity, of course there should, could be plasticity, but this plasticity occurs in the minutes because you can turn off Sakin D1 and then if there is any compensatory mechanism, it kicks in, in, in immediately because the mice are healthy and then and they have a normal lifespan. So now we can, we, we can ask what happens if we turn off Psychin D1 in a mouse that develop breast cancer. So to do this, Yun took her conditional Psychin D1 knockout mice, expressing inducible CRE, and crossed them with the breast cancer prone strain that I mentioned, MMTV or B2 or NU. So, so these are the mice that are going to develop and they, and they, they express cancer causing genes in mammary glands. So they are going to develop breast cancers. And then once they develop breast cancer, after, after, after we can see tumors, we are going to give them tamoxifen and we are going to delete Psychin D1 in the whole body, including in tumor. And what happens? So, any, any guesses what would happen? The answer is going to be the next slide, so we have an instant uh, answer. W what do you think will happen? Sorry? Well, but it's too late for resistance, they already have tumors. In previously we had resistance, but now we have a mouse. The mouse developed tumors, we check every day. The mouse developed tumors, tumor is going, tumor is growing. When the tumor is middle, we, we give mice, uh, we, we delete Psychin D1 everywhere. And what would happen? Sorry? A reduction. Why reduction? Okay, so, so well, there are three possibilities. Either the tumor will continue growing, it will stop growing, or they will reduce. So, 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 so that's the answer. So first of all, when we get rid of Psychin D1 in a mouse that already developed breast cancer, then once again there is no impact on, on the female physiology. So that's good news. As far as tumor growth, the tumor growth stops. 
it doesn't shrink, but it shrops. And this is the, the this is the tumor size. So each dot corresponds to different tumor in control mice. And this is in the mice when we ablate it, like in D1. And this is uh, and this is um, in, in a tumor burden in control mice. And this is in in in, in mice that we knocked out, like in D1. And what do you think happens to those tumors? Well, why they stop growing? Sorry? So I, so I suppose that uh, there is something about they just stop uh, dividing, stop proliferating. Right. So, so that was, uh, I, I think it's very good. That was exactly what we expected. And this was, at the same time, the cr criticism of this experiment is that it will stop dividing, meaning a transient cell cycle arrest. And indeed, when you look at the proliferation rate shown here by staying for K67, this is control, this is like in D1 knockout. A surprise came when Yun stained these cells for senescence-associated beta-gal, which is the marker of irreversible senescence. And what we found, if you knock out like in D1, that these cells are undergo senescence. And this is actually quantification of senescence cells and control in psychin D1 knockouts. I, I, I want to point out that, that we, we are deleting psychin D1 in a whole female, including in the breast and including in her breast cancer. But only breast cancer cells undergo senescence. The rest of the, of, of, the, of the mouse cells proliferate normally and the mouse remains healthy. But we are seeing indeed the, 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 the reversible senescence. Now, at that time, the pharmaceutical companies developed the inhibitors of cycling D, CDK4, CDK6 kinase. And at that time, the first inhibitor was available. This was developed by Pfizer called PD0332991. So, with this inhibitor, this very specific inhibitor of cycling D, CDK4 kinase. So, now we could do the experiment that, that I think you suggested, but rather than knocking out cycling D1, we just give the mice inhibitor. So we, so we take the, the mice, we wait until they develop cancer, and after they develop cancer, we give mice inhibitor. And once again, we basically phenocopy like in D1 knockout, meaning the tumors stop growing. This is the size of the tumors in control mice, and this is the inhibitor treated mice. This is the mean tumor burden in control, and the inhibitor treated mice, and we are triggering tumor specific senescence. So this is senescence. Uh, in, the, in the tumor, this is non a tumor of the non-treated mice, and this is percentage of the uh, of the senescence cells. So in summer, there is like in D1 CDK4 activity is not required for normal mouse physiology, and now we have shown it not through genetic knockout, but rather through acute shutdown in in in, in, in adult mouse. Either we turn off like in D1, or we give mice inhibitor for a long time that inhibits the kinase activity. However, this function is required for breast cancer maintenance, and then inhibit of cycling D1 and CDK4 activity not only triggers cell cycle arrest, as one would expect, but it also triggers irreversible tumor cell senescence. Now, Yun was so encouraged by her result, then she decided to go one step further. And was one step further, meaning like three years longer. Because she, she wanted to know whether this specific requirement for cycling D1 is just for cycling D1 in breast cancer, or this is for, for different cyclines in different tumor types. So she decided to go to a different kind of, not even cancer, but to take leukemia, because that's, of course, different, different, the, the, the different kind of malignancy. And in, in human leukemias, a protein that is overexpressed is not cycling D1, but it's cycling D3. So she wanted to know whether if you can completely different tumor type leukemia uh, and completely different um, cycling, would she have the same effect? Would it also be tumor specific? Would it also be only cell cycle arrest as, as, as people were pr predicted? Or maybe it's going to be also senescent? So to answer this question, she generated a conditional cycling D3 knockout mice, which is identical kind of approach to cyc conditional cycling D1 knockout. So I, 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 I will not explain to you, I would just say that, that now she has the mice where she can specifically turn off cycling D3. 
and she can do it through inducible Cree. There are two different inducible Cree strains that she's using, and through this one, she can come to the lab, she can turn off cycling D3 and see what happens, and the mice remain viable. So, as was the case for cycling D1, we can turn off cycling D3 in an adult mouse, and also we would not kill the mouse, and the mouse survives. So, the good news is that this, 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 the, the fact that we can turn off cycling D1 in an adult mouse is not just D1, now we can turn off cycling D3 in an adult mouse, and also we, can, we don't kill the mouse. So, now what happens if we turn off cycling D3 in a mouse that has leukemia? Would it also target specific leukemic cells? Well, the, I, I mentioned to you, I actually talked to, for the past hour, how we study breast cancer in mice by having this a transgenic strain that activates cancer causing gene in her breast. So probably for leukemia, we would do it by, by, by targeting cancer causing gene to the leukemic cells, to, to, the bone, to the bone marrow cells, but it's done slightly differently. So in our experiment, we take our mice, these are going to be conditional knockout, and we harvest the bone marrow cells, and we solve their hematopoietic stem cells, because these are the cells of origin of T-cell accumulating leukemia. And then into these cells, we infect with the virus, encoding notch, why we are using NOTCH? Because NOTCH is a cancer of the oncogene that is f f uh, involved in overwhelming majority of human leukemias, in particular T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or TAAL for short. So TAL is caused in humans by the NOTCH activation. We can mimic it in mice by taking mouse against stem cells, by putting activated notch. We also put GFP because this way the cells are green, so we can follow them, and then we can, we can inject these, these transformed cells into the recipient mice, and then what happens is already two weeks after post -bar, after bone marrow transplantation, uh, these cells have leukemic cells in their peripheral blood, and after 10 weeks they are going to be die because of tumors. In our experiment, we take conditional knockout hematopoietic progenitor cells, like in D3 knockout, we put activated notch, we put them into recipient mice, we wait till weeks, two weeks, until they develop leukemic cells in peripheral blood, and then we turn off cycling D3. And what happens is that those leukemic cells disappear. These are leukemic cells before, and this is after ablation of cycling D3, and this is quantification. And if we observe mice for tumors, the control mice will die, and these mice we can cure. There was one mouse that died, and the reason this mouse was died, but in this one, we just had a technical failure. We did not delete cycling D3, but we are, of course, showing it for honesty, but this is not a true biology, but rather our technical failure. So if you get rid of cycling D3 very early on, and during the disease progression, when you have leukemic cells, you can block the, uh, the, the, the progression of the leukemia. So now, let's do a more ambitious experiment. Now we are going to take the hematopoietic progenitor cells from conditional knockout mice, put activated notch, put it into recipient mice, but now we'll wait six weeks before knocking out cycling D3. So now we'll knock out cycling D3 after these mice have tumors. And now we are going to look at tumor cells. Tumor cells are these leukemic cells that are infiltrating the organs. Here from the spleen. This is before and this is after ablation of cycling D3. The tumor cells again disappear. Now, Unfortunately, at this time, there are so many tumor cells that if we, if, if we try to knock out cycling D3, we are not going to knock it out in 100% of tumor cells. So, so, so these mice, th this is the survival of control mice, and this is G3 knockout mice. So now we can prolong, but we cannot cure these mice, but always when we take the tumors here, they are deriving from undeleted cells. So this is just a technical issue, right? That if you have, if you have lots of tumor cells, if this is one or two cells that, that you did not um, knock out cycling D3, that they are going to continue to proliferate and they are going to kill the mouse. Now, this disappearance of cells suggested to Yun that this is not cell cycle arrest, but it could be what? Well, what do you think? Why the cells could be disappearing? Yes. Right, exactly. So, so, so this suggested to us that this is cell death. And this was completely unexpected because we expect cell cycle arrest, of course. Now, after the breast cancer experiment, we, we know, in retrospect, we know that we could expect senescence, but there's no senescence here, but actually this disappearance of cells uh, 
uh, suggest that actually it's not just cell cycle arrest, but this is cell death. And sure enough, uh, when, when, when uh, uh, um, uh, Yun did the staining of sections with the tunnel staining, which, tells, which shows apoplotic cells, this is, this is the spleen, and those black cells are two more cells that are dying after we knock out cytokine D3. Now, now we have the inhibitor of, cyc of, of, of the kinase activity, so rather than knocking out cytokine D3, we can, we can wait until these mice give, get leukemia and then give them the inhibitor. And when we give them inhibitor, we see that the tumor cells disappear. So this is before and this is after the inhibitor. This is the number before and after. And the apoptosis goes up. This is apoptotic rate before and after treated with inhibitor. And this is, uh, and this is the, 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 the mean values. So by, giving, by, by knocking out cytokine D3 or by giving mice the inhibitor, we can wipe out the leukemic cells. By, 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 by killing them. And this is actually a pharmacological experiment. In this experiment, we, we take mice, uh, and then at two weeks, we put them into two different groups. The first group is going to be untreated, and they're going to die like this, and the red ones are going to be treated. And as you can see, a large fraction of mice, we can actually completely cure. We, we can kill all the cells, the tumor cells, and these mice become tumor-free. I, I, I think this one is actually more impressive because here, here are starting treatment very early when, when the pre-leukemic the leukemic cells are going to pre Here, we are starting the treatment right here at six weeks. So this is one week before the mice will start dying. And then if we don't do anything, then these mice will start dying and then all of them will die. If we start treatment that most of the red mice, the red mice being of course the treated mice, most of these mice become tumor free. So by just giving inhibitor with the mice that already have a lot of tumors, we can kill, or kill all tumor um, cells specifically and selectively and then we can make them tumor free. Now that's all great, but this is cancer in mice. And people joke, you know, that if the cancer, you know, if treating cancer in mice is very easy, and then if treating humans were as easy as in mice, then we would have treated cancer a long time ago. And of course, this is this is true. So we wanted to to to, to start applying it to human cancers. So here we take human T cell acuminoblastic leukemias. These are the cell lines. Th these cells actually are engineered to express luciferase, so we can measure the tumor burden in mice. We inject them into mice, and the mice develop human leukemia, because these are human leukemic cells that are, that are giving leukemia in mice. And once they develop leukemia, we start treating mice, giving mice with inhibitor for one, two, three, four, five days. And after five days, we measure tumor burden. So this is beginning of the experiment. If we don't give the inhibitor, then the tumor burden increases or in this cell line dramatically, if we give mice the inhibitor, the tumor burden actually decreases, suggesting that we have a killing in vivo, in mouse. This is killing of human cells in mice. And now at the end of the experiment, we sacrifice mice, we take the peripheral blood of the bone marrow, we get only on human cells, because we want to know what happens to those human tumor cells, and look for apoptotic rate. This is untreated, and this is treated, this is untreated, this is treated. So there is very massive apoptosis of human cancer cells, of human leukemic cells, in vivo in mice, by giving this inhibitor. But this is a very short term, this is five days. So now what happens for the long term? So here we'll wait until these mice develop leukemia, and we are going to give them inhibitor for a very long time. And after 27 days, because the, these cells are luciferized, so they glow, so as you can see, the control mice are laden with tumors, but the treated mice, virtually all tumors are gone. And this is actually tumor burden, this is the untreated mice, and these are treated mice, and this is survival, untreated and treated. So the good news is that this inhibitor works very well against human cells. The bad news is that the human cells eventually uh, develop resistance. Because even though we can almost wipe out the cells, eventually they will come back. They will be resistant and they are going to kill the mouse. This is the second cell line and this looks great. Uh, this is the tumor burden in non-treated mice and this is tumor burden in treated mice. This is survival of control mice. This is of treated mice. It looks great because the slide has not been updated. Because if, if, if you look for longer, they, they will eventually die. 
So, so this is uh, so, so, so this is just this cell line looks a little bit better than this cell line, but we cannot cure this. We cannot wipe up 100% of cells. We can wipe out 99.9% .9 of cells. We can extend the life, but we cannot uh, completely cure the mice. So the summary of this, and this is the last uh, uh, thing that I am showing today, is that cytokine D1 and CDK4 is, re is, is not required for normal mouth physiology, but is required for the maintenance of T cell lymphoblastic leukemias and the inhibition of cytokine D1 and CDK4 for triggers tumor cells apoptosis. So now they, they are inhibitors of these uh, of this kinases. I mentioned the one from, from, from the Pfizer, there is also another one from Novartis, there is also another one from Lili, and those inhibitors are clinical trials. Last year in San Antonio in December, uh, there was a first report about using this inhibitor in breast cancer uh, and, and it, 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 it received the so-called breakthrough status because the results are great. This was given to, to women with a metastatic breast cancer uh, whose cancer spread to the bone uh, and that the disease-free, sorry, the progression-free sur progression survival in a control group was only seven months, so it's very short. But in treated one was 21, so it was three times uh, in, uh, as long. Uh, this was with one anti-estrogenic um, uh, um, therapy. Another one, I was in American Association for Cancer Research meeting two weeks ago, uh, and there was a pres another presentation with another drug where the uh, um, progression-free survival time was doubled from 10 months to 20 months. So it was very, very promising. And also, this is all in breast cancer, but I mentioned to you our work on actual on leukemia, or T-cell acute leukemia, this is our own work, and based on this work, our institute is now uh, um, starting a clinical trial where patients with TAL is going to be treated with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, this, uh, with this inhibitor. So if you, if, you, if you invite me like two years from now or three years from now, maybe I can tell you uh, whether, whether, whether how well it's working and whether what looked so promising in, in the lab and in mice, whether it holds true uh, in, in, in patients. So in, in summary, in, in, in today's talk I told you about the, the, the cell cycle machinery. I mentioned to you about the proteins that were thought to be absolutely essential for, for, for cell division, uh, essential components of the core cell cycle machinery. They turn out that they are not essential components of the core cell cycle machinery, but for some reason they are essential for tumors. And they are not just essential for tumor proliferation, but they are essential for other functions, for, for anti-senescence in case of cycling D1 and breast cancer, and for survival of cycling D3. And this very unexpectedly makes them very, very attractive candidates for, 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 for cancer therapy. So we were completely the full circle from, 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 uh, from of course, understanding and appreciating that, that these proteins are key drivers of, 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 of cancer cells, because ultimately all those cancer signals will impinge on those proteins. So, so by, by blocking those proteins, we, you, you are blocking the influence of those cancer signals, plus, as I mentioned, in several cancers, actually these are those proteins that are, that, that are drivers of cancer, but, but, but we thought, well, this is all great, but those proteins are required in every cell and every division. It turns out not to be the case, but it turns out to be the case uh, in, 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 in cancers. And then this is, uh, you know, you have, uh, you probably have heard that the funding situation in the United States is not good, uh, but it's not so bad that we have to hire children uh, or, or senior citizens. As a matter of fact, we don't hire children, it would be, it would be illegal, but this was just a picnic, uh, and uh, the, it was raining, and the half hour we have the, 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 the picnic at sight. And I would like to highlight two people. Uh, first of all, Chuan Yin Yu. Uh, Chuan Yin, as I mentioned, came from, she actually has a very interesting story because she went from China to, che to Czech Republic, and from Czech Republic to to, to, to United States, where she did PhD in my lab. Uh, she, she was responsible for the first part of my talk, and now she's living happily in the United States with her husband uh, and with her son. This is this is with her husband, uh, Jian Yu, and this is her, her son, Dong Dong Yu. Uh, she, she was very, when she was in my lab, she was a single, uh, um, she, um, uh, she was a single mother because her husband was actually uh, as a, as a, together with Chinese army doctor in Tanzania, 
probably spreading communist ideology in Tanzania. So she was a single mother, and she would bring this this donk donk, who was a very little boy, in, uh, from school uh, to, to the lab, and this boy would do homework on a bench, and then he would sleep on a bench when she was finishing her experiments. So she spent. Uh, so I tell him that he's kind of honorary member on my lab because he spent many 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 many, many, many hours as a childhood. You know, the time has passed, and now he's uh, he's a grown up kid. And then the second uh, person I need to highlight is Yun Choi. Uh, and Yun, as I mentioned, is a Korean-born postdoc uh, who, who, who took this one step further and made all those conditional knockout mice. Uh, and, then, and, then, and, and, and then studied what happens if you turn off a uh, cycling device. She was also actually helped with the senescence analysis by Per Hidbrick. This is a tall guy uh, who is from Sweden. Uh, so. I don't think that I need to highlight anybody else. Okay, so I thank you for your attention, and then I take ten, some questions now, and if not, uh, I'll sit here, and then we can, we can talk one on one. So thank you very much. So you can ask questions now, but if you are shy, we can we, we can talk one on one. But there are two non-shy people. Okay, so uh, maybe I can refer to the beginning. Yes. Talk, uh, but uh, why the mice uh, with, with conditional knockouts uh, are no, feel normal uh, when uh, you conditionally knock down uh, the one of the mm -hmm. isoforms or the kinases. Uh, does other isoforms, uh, for example, D2 or D3, they uh, substitute D D1 when mm -hmm. you knock out the right. condition? What, what's going on? Right. All right, so this is a really great question. The, 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 the only thing I don't like, but it's just my personal taste, is I don't like calling it isoforms. And the reason I don't like calling it, uh, people do it, they, they, people do it, but I, I don't like it because isoforms suggest that they're all the same protein, and this is the, so, so it makes them more interesting, right? different isoforms. But, but, but you are right, people do it. But, but these are actually different genes. So, so, so the, first of all, let's, let, let's ask whether, whether, whether those three, it's so like in D1, D2, D3. Are they different isoforms, like tissue-specific isoforms of the same proteins, or are they completely different proteins doing completely different things? So Brad Carthon, uh, a former student in, 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 in my lab, Brad Carthon is a is, is, is very remarkable student in my lab because he was the only student that was American, like really, 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 like kind of um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, born American. So what, what Brad Carthon did is he, he, he asked this question by, 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 by saying, okay, if we knock out cycling D1, then we have the retinal and the breast problem. Cycling D1 is expressed in retina. Cycling D2 is not expressed retina. What if we knock out cycling D1 and at the same time we express cycling D2 there? So he made a knock in mouse where he knocks out cycling D1 and replaces cycling D1 with D2. So he's making mice that don't have cycling D1, like cycling D1 knockout mice, but now cycling D2 is expressed in the eye and in the breast. And what he found is that these retinas and breasts is almost normal. Not 100% normal, but very close to normal. So this indicated that the major function, at least my interpretation, is our interpretation is that the major function of cycling D1 versus D2 is just in the sequence of the promoters, right? They express in tissue-specific fashion. But if you correct the evolution, and now you make the mouse for the first time ever that expresses cycling D2 instead of cycling D1 in, in the eye, cycling D2 can work almost as good as cycling D1, but not as good. So, 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 so my interpretation was that those proteins evolve to, to perform probably very similar functions, but, but for example, in retina, cycling D1 does it better than cycling D2. Now, at the same time, uh, when, I, when I, um, uh, uh, I talked today about cycling D3 knockout, and I said, I was careful to say that, cycling, that if you knock out cycling D3, it does not affect viability. But th there are some mild phenotypes of cycling, of, 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 of cycling D3 knockouts that we can talk later, these are hematopathic phenotypes. Yanis Aifantis, uh, who is in New York University, he's an American scientist born in Greece, he made a knock-in, where he, so we knocked out Sakin D3, and he now puts Sakin D2 there. When Sakin D2 puts in Sakin D3 locus, it cannot rescue. 
So at least in this compartment, this is what D3 does, D3 does, and D2 cannot do it. In I, what D1 does, D2 can do, although not as, as well. So I, I think that the bottom line is that those are similar proteins, but not the same. Now, getting back to your, your question. Uh, if you knock out in D1, there is very little phenotype. Maybe other, uh, as you call isoforms, D2 or D3, can compensate for this. So, when we knock out in D1, that was exactly the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the explanation. It was very surprising, but people can say that probably in D2 um, um, can compensate or D3. So, so we predicted that if you knock out two D-type psychings, for example, D1, D2, or D1, D3, well now, it's going to be a very dramatic phenotype. So Anja Czemerich, who was a postdoc in my lab from Poland, did this experiment. And what she found is if you take psychic D1 knockout mice and psychic D2 knockout mice and you breed them together, that you get the phenotype of psychic D1 knockout mice and D2 knockout mice, but nothing more. And if you take D1 and D3, that you have D1 and D3 phenotype, but nothing more. But then the argument was that if you knock out D1 and D2, there is D3 there. If you knock out D1 and D3, there is D2. So there is remaining cycling that can compensate. So Kasia Kozar, a former graduate student in my lab back from Poland, generated triple knockout mice, where she knocked out psychic D1, ND2, ND3. And there's no compensation now. And what she found is that if these embryos develop normally until day 13.5. So the pregnancy is in, in mice is 19 days. So between time zero and between and between day 13, there is lots of cell divisions, and those cell divisions are proceeding perfectly normally uh, in the uh, in the uh, in, 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 in the absence of cycling D. And at the same time, our competitors from from Madrid made the CDK4 knockout mice. Quite normal, but people argued, well, this is CDK6 that is compensating. They made CDK6 knockout mice, quite normal. People say CDK4 is compensating. And then they did CDK4, CDK6 double knockout mice, and the phenotype is exactly the same as triple D. They, they, they go through the, uh, to the, to the uh, um, uh, um, uh, day 13.5, and now they die. So, and they are dying because not that this is required for proliferation of all cells, it's just that this time it's required for hematopoiesis. Uh, so, 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 overwhelming majority of the cells can proliferate without D-type cyclines with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the, um, the kind of a phenotype that that, uh, that that is specific to hematopoiesis. So, it's not the compensation. Uh, uh, cycling, right? The uh, TLL is uh, cycling three, and what about others? For instance, renal cancer, and other. No. Yeah. Right. You know, um, we chose we chose those two breast cancers because uh, th th this is the most striking. Uh, it is most striking that cycling D one is overexpressed in over fifty percent of human breast cancers. And for, for, for TAL, we chose TAL because generally speaking, in the hematopoietic lineages, like in D1 is poorly expressed. Uh, and then, and then there, there, is, there, there, there is this. But for, for every cancer types, there, there, there is different pattern of this cycling expression. There is lots of literature about this. I just don't remember this. But one of the most, one of the very kind of remarkable ones and interesting ones is that uh, in the, in, the, in the hematopoietic lineage, cycling D1 is normally not expressed. Uh, in hematopoietic lineage, cycling D2 and cycling D3, but there is no D1. There is no D1 being expressed. And there are, there is, there are two, um, there is um, a, a, a hematopoietic malignancy called mantle cell lymphoma and multiple myeloma, where there is a rearrangement between a cycling D1 gene an immunoglobulin heavy chain enhancer. So now through this translocation, you're activating cycling D1 in a B cell lineage. And this is seen in overwhelming majority 
of mantle cell lymphomas, and it's seen, I don't remember, but it's like 90% and of, 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 of multiple myelomas. And a very interesting question that I don't know the answer, is it, is it just that you know you, you just happen to overexpress cytokine D1 in, in this lineage, or that there's something specific about cytokine D1 that you're turning on um, um, a, a cytokine D which is normally not expressed? So, so, so to answer a question, typically, like kind of the things that, that stick to my mind is that cytokine D1 in breast cancer. There's, oops, there's also, like for example, cytokine D2 gene is amplified in certain testicular cancers. Cytokine D2 is overexpressed in some granulosa cells fr fr from from ovary, there is this very famous translocation of cytokine D1 because now you have cytokine D1 that's normally not expressed, uh, in, uh, which is which is which is now expressed in in, in multiple cell lymphoma and multiple myeloma, and there are, there, there are many other cases where cytokine, where cytokine D1 gene is amplified or overexpressed. One thing to be careful about reading the literature is that people quite often abuse a word overexpression. So if you if, if you put if, if you if you're interested in any of those genes, let's say that you, you're interested in cytokine D3, and then and then you are interested in pancreatic cancer. So you, you, you and you will say, well, maybe the cytokine D3 is involved in pancreatic cancer. If you do a PubMed search and do cytokine D3 overexpression in pancreatic cancer, it's very likely that there is going to be a paper uh, showing that there is overexpression. But you really have to be careful because this word is being abused in literature. What people do is that when they talk about overexpression, is that they say, well, let's see if my gene is overexpressed in breast cancer. So what they do is they, they take a breast cancer and as a control, they take a normal breast from women who, who, who have reduction mammoplasty because they want to have a smaller breast. So, so part of the breast is, is removed, and this is a perfect control because this is normal non transformed mammary glands. But this is comparing apple oranges, right? Because you're in the, the cancer cell is the ball of proliferating of epithelial cells, and you are comparing with the fat and the quiescent tissue. So almost every cell cycle protein that is involved in cell cycling is going to be higher in your cycling cells rather than your quiescent fat cells. But it doesn't mean that this protein is overexpressed. So you really have to, 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 to be very careful. For cytokine D1, actually, first of all, we know that the gene is amplified. So this is always a good sign, right? So, it's, so, so this kind of a genetic event, the gene is amplified. Number two, people have to have shown that if you overexpress it in a breast that it causes cancer. And seg th thirdly, is that people have shown early on that they, they, people did the, the quantitative staining where they can quantify the level of cytokine D1 per cell, per nucleus. And they have shown that in the, in the sample from the tumor, the signal from the tumor is higher than the signal from normal cell in the same women's breast, but the, the normal cell is cycling and, and the cancer cell is cycling, but this is higher, and this is true overexpression. But, on the, but, 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 but most of the data of the literature is comparing malignant um, 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 transformation with somebody's fat. Yeah, that's correct. So, do you know what's the difference yeah. between why do cells yeah. adapt? Right. And can you, for example, inhibit this adaption using somehow similar methods? Yeah. You know, this is a great question. This is really a great question. I, I, I just want to make a small correction. Is that I would not call it adaptation by resistance. Right? Because this is really resistance, probably. Not, uh, of course, it's adaptation to the drug, but, but, but we call it resistance. And, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, and and that's, that's, uh, that, that's the, probably uh, the, the, the major take home message is that we can kill uh, the, the mouse cells, but we cannot kill the human cells. So, uh, the, 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 there is an optimistic view and pessimistic view. The, the optimistic view would be that. In mice, this is really kind of a true situation, right? We, we take the hematopoietic progeny, so the stem cells, we put the oncogene, we put it into the mice, we develop um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the disease, and then we treat uh, those, uh, the, 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 these mice. In human situation, we are taking the cell lines. And these cell lines have been passage for many, for, for, for many years in culture, and God knows what happened in those cells. They probably have some other changes, and this is why we can 
cannot kill them all. This is why, why there are some resistant cells. This is the optimist point of view. A pessimist point of view, or real, I think realist point of view, because this is my point of view, is that this is just a difference between mouse cells and human cells. And then human cancer cells are heterogeneous, uh, and then they, they, they are going to be a small clones of cells that are going to be resistant. So, so you ask, what's the mechanism? So, so we have no idea what's the mechanism, but actually, um, uh, um, uh, 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 if, I, if, if it rains in, in, in St. Petersburg, rather than seeing this beautiful city, I'll sit and write. I, I'm actually writing right now a grant application. This is a grant of several groups that from Harvard community. It used to be a grant with Harald van Bommel, who I understand what, what was teaching here. But now, unfortunately, he retired. But there is a group of five or six immunologists from Harvard and from MIT. And my lab is part of this. And we, we are writing a joint proposal. And one of, one of the questions that we, we are asking is exactly, you know, your, your, your question. What's the mechanism of resistance of human cells and how we can target this? So again, if it rains and if I get money, then I'll know in five years, maybe. But uh, yeah. Correct, yeah, yeah. And you showed that uh, 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 D1 minus mice, uh, minus mice are also you know, have, have a good life case. I'm sorry, the, the, uh, I'll come closer to you so I can hear you. So, so, so I have shown that D1 minus minus, what do they do? So, uh, the mouse with the D1 minus mice are also alive, yes? Yes, yes, yes. So, and the, the question is, uh, why the evolution need gene D1? Okay. If uh, the mouse without D1 is also alive. Okay, so. So I don't know if everybody heard that. Th 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 this is more a philosophical question. Uh, and the, 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 the nice lady is asking me if. Uh, if you can remove cytokine D1 and the mouse is viable, why this gene was, uh, was preserved in evolution? Well, clearly not to cause breast cancer, right? So, you know, th th this is the question for God, not for me, right? So, uh, so, so I don't know. But, you know, many scientists think that they're, God, they're gods, so I'll try to answer this question. You know, uh, I think that, I think that, uh, the, 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 there is, in, in a cell cycle machinery, the, 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 the ability, so first of all, cycling D1 is required. Because if you knock out cycling D1, you don't get normal mouse. You have a mouse that is blind, because the retina is, is, is completely underdeveloped. You have the, the, the female that cannot breastfeed the pups because the mammary glands, um, uh, the, the mammary glands do not expand. And then, and then thirdly, something I didn't mention is that they have some neurological phenotype. They have some abnormal neurological reflexes uh, um, that, uh, that, that we don't understand. So in the evolution, if, if, there, was a, if, if there were a mutant, of, of human mutant, uh, that don't have cycling D1, they would be immediately eliminated because the f maybe the blindness is not so important, but the females would not be able to breastfeed, right? You, 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 you could get foster mothers, but of course this is not the same, so, 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 so the, the, the fitness. So, so I think that for cycling D1, we can, uh, we can easily um, uh, defend it. For other, uh, for, for other um, uh, but, but there are examples of, of, of cell cycle proteins where you cannot find the phenotype. And, uh, and the question is why, and I think that there are two explanations. Number, the, the, I think the explanation is that those proteins, because the cell division is such a vital um, function that, uh, that, that, that there, there, there are many backup mechanisms be between those proteins, that if you take one, that the remaining, even in, in, immediately, so this is not kind of long-term developmental, but, but, but immediately can, 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 take, um, can take function. And the second is that quite often 
that the normal phenotype or the absence of the phenotype is caused by the by the by, by, by the kind of shelter environment that we are analyzing these mice in 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 in, 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 in the lab. For example, psychic D3 knockout mice that I mentioned have a normal lifespan, right? I said several times psychic D3 knockout mice have normal lifespan. Psychic D3 knockout mice have normal lifespan were kept in a sterile uh, um, um, uh, mouse facility at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. What they have as a very mild phenotype is that they neutrophils do not respond to granulocyte GCSF, granulocyte colon stimulating factor. This is really a minor thing. I, I think it's not worth talking about this, but yes, if, if you take those granulocytes and if you stimulate them with GCSF, they don't proliferate normally. Nobody cares. This is a small little detail. However, if we take mice and we challenge them with bacteria, with Listeria, it will immediately kill psychic D3 knockout mice because they cannot um, uh, uh, mount granulocyte response. We did this experiment. Yong Mi Lee, a former postdoc from Korea, took the the uh, the, 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 the listeria and then she she, she she treated control mice and D3 knockout mice with listeria. And then when she treated, we found out that my lab has no permission to work with bacteria. So I really nearly had to shut down my lab because of this violation. Finally, we finish the experiment, and what takes what happens is that if you inject bacteria into control mice, they have immune response, and the bacteria is cleared. If you if you inject them into psychic DC um, 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 uh, uh, knockout mice, they are completely wiped out because they have they have bacterial abscesses in, in all the organs. So so those proteins are required. They they are just not required in this unusual environment. Did I answer your question? Yes. Uh, is it okay related to your talk today? I was just going to ask you if you could uh, just briefly outline what's gonna, what it's going to be about tomorrow. Just a couple of words to what our appetite is. Okay, okay, so I need to remember what. Uh, okay, so, so tomorrow I am thinking of doing a two talks. The first talk is going to be a heavy talk, uh, and, 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 and in this talk, I am going to tell you about two. Oh, actually, here I can use this slide for for, for the um, for, for, for the introduction. So we, we talked about the D-type cyclines. There is another two classes of cyclines: E-type cyclines and A-type cyclines. These proteins are thought by the textbooks to be absolutely essential components of the core cell cycle machinery, in particular A, because cyclin E and cyclin D are the ones that operate in the G1 phase of the cell cycle. So at least you could imagine there, is, there could be some compensation between those proteins. But A-type cyclins are the only cyclins that are expressed in the in, 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 in S phase. And in fact, I told you that, uh, that uh, if we knock out cyclin D1, there is very little phenotype. We, we can discuss whether this is compensation or whether, or, 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 or whether this is not. But the bottom line, that these mice are, are normal. You can knock out D2, you can knock out D3. But if you knock out cyclin A2, that they are dying in embryo development as soon as the maternal stores are depleted. So there is some come from the for, for, for mother as soon as maternal contribution dies. So, so is it true what the textbooks say is that E-type cyclines or A-type cyclines are, are, are really essential components? So I'll tell you about our work on, on cyclin E knockout or cyclin A knockout. Cyclin E knockout is made by Yang Geng, uh, an instructor, so this kind of a permanent faculty position, originally from China, now American. And cyclin A is worked by Ilona Kalaszczynska, a former graduate student from Poland. This is lecture number one. If you survive lecture number one, the lecture number two is going to be very light. But I, I think it's, it's, it's cool. And the lecture number two is about the following thing. Cyclin E, like all those proteins, are cell cycle proteins. Uh, they, uh, maybe I can. Right, so they are, they, they, they are cell cycle proteins, meaning they, 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 they cycle. Their levels go up and down. They levels go up and down. Uh, 
So if you take proliferating cells, they express D-type cyclin, cyclin E, and cyclin A. If you take quiescent cells, they don't express those proteins, right? Because these are the proteins that drive cell proliferation. If you take proliferating cells, you can actually tell which phase of the cell cycle this phase the cell is, right? For example, if the cells express cyclin A, it must be in an S phase. If it expresses cyclin E, this is lazy G1 and S phase. About 10 years ago, we discovered that in the brain, there is very high level of cyclin E. Now, brain is of course composed of non-dividing cells. These cells are not proliferating, and they have very high level of cyclin E. And there was actually a group in Japan where they also found that there is high level of cyclin E. And Junko Dajima spent five years in my lab to try to understand what's the function, why in our brains, and in your brains too, you have high level of cyclin E, and why it is so, why the evolution took the cell cycle protein and activated in non-proliferating brain cells. And this is going to be the second talk. Nothing to do with the cell cycle. This is anti-cell cycle. This is a cell cycle. This is, this is you, you will learn about the accident of the evolution. In the, in, the, in the evolution, millions of years ago, for some accident, the protein, they, they should not be expressed in, in, in the neurons. Um, uh, uh, cyclin E became activated in neurons and it partnered with the wrong protein and you will see what happened. Um, okay, I suggest that if there are any questions left, uh, we give them to the final talk and uh, thanks again. Great.